Hello. Hello, friends. Welcome in. Mic check. I see the chat is already bumping a little bit. We'll get to that. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in on this beautiful Sunday. Making sure all my software looks good. I think it does. Let's do it. Hello, hello. Welcome, friends, and happy Easter. This is Alpha Beta Soup. I'm TXMC. Welcome in. You know, I thought about doing this stream a few days ago, and when I did it, I didn't quite realize that it was also Easter. But I need my Monday available, because I'm going out of town for a few days in the middle of the week. So I can't do it tomorrow, and I don't want to leave you guys hanging. So bang! Easter stream, baby. Bring it in. Hope everyone's doing well. Had some family time earlier. We had some mimosas. We had some brunch. We did some egg hunting. It was lovely. I hope whatever it is that you do on a day like today, you were able to do that. And I thank you for then taking some time to join me today so we can talk about some things that I find interesting. This will be a stream that is light on charts. Today, I want to explore the concept of manias and paper money crises. <clears throat> it's a topic near and dear to my heart as a amateur financial historian. And I think it is very appropriate for us to touch on those topics in the world we live in today. And I think that by the end of this stream, you will understand why I feel that way. Um, there's not always a perfect parallel for the current time, right? There's always some unique factors about the present day that make it impossible to point at something that happened before and go, we're doing that all over again. But usually you can find bits and pieces, ingredients from prior recipes that are existing in whatever pot of stew we're boiling today. <clears throat> and I find a lot of those parallels the further back in time I go. And when I one of the patterns that seems to come up in a lot of this is most financial crises center around an excess of money, right? Too much money chasing too few goods, a period of irrationality that drives values far beyond their true, you know, uh, their true value, and then some kind of a reckoning point. And during those periods, you can find a lot of common traits from ancient China, uh, crises in Europe, things that happened in the U.S. in the 17 and 1800s, all the way up until today, you can find these similar threads of human behavior and some of the kind of markers of discussions at the time. And I just find that stuff fascinating. Uh, so I want to talk about some of that today. I've highlighted a bunch of passages uh, from a couple of books that I read, and I'm going to tie them to some things that we look at today. So I hope you find it interesting. Uh, before we get started, I want you to know that I, I'm not a, an expert on every piece of history that we're going to touch on today, uh, but I just, I've read some books and highlighted a lot of things that I think are really interesting, and so that's what the angle I want to take at from today, an angle of curiosity, not an angle of, I know all this cool stuff and I'm going to teach you, uh, but just come along with me. We'll read some things, we'll think about it, try to apply it to today, uh, and I just kind of want to get you into my mind state as I've been looking at the markets the last couple of years. And while we do a lot of data-heavy analysis on this channel, right? We do a lot of recession analysis, market study. We look at rates of change. We go deep into the data. And our theses about what's going on in the markets is driven by data. But when you think about the holistic picture and you think about the quality of societal discussion and like some of the lack of trust in institutions and the topics and things that we talk about and the troubles that certain households at certain income levels are having because of all of the money imbalances. Like a lot of that stuff is the same and we can learn from those things if we have a lens of history with which to view today's events. So 
the the way I want to start this is so last week after we had our public stream, I did a private member stream for a bunch of the homies in the chat that have green names that have chosen to become channel members, uh, and we did a private stream and. One of the one of the folks in there, Oscar Santana, who I who may or may not be in here today, he asked a really good question, and I gave an answer that's about four or five minutes long, and I want to play that for you, the whole audience, because there were only about thirty people in that stream, and it will tee up what I want to talk about today, because I think rather than me just trying to say all of that in a different way, I want you to just hear what I said, and then we'll take it from there. But before I do that. I got to acknowledge some of these homies in the chat. It's really popping off here. You guys are, you guys are overwhelming me. So we got in the chat <laughs> before we get started. Steve Hilly upgraded his membership to a Founders Club. What it do, baby? Welcome, Steve. That's amazing. Thank you for your generosity. Can't can't thank you enough for that. Crypto Lolek member for two months says just wanted to thank you for your amazing expertise and your different approach to these markets. I love it. Two times a week would be great. Take care. Thank you, Lolek. I appreciate it. I've been seeing you in the chat for a long time, so I, I thank you for your constant support. David Kyra, gifting a membership, one of the most generous membership gifters here on the channel. Thank you, bro. Always good to see you. And Andy Philpot, I see you, and you know what, dude? I've got a little post-it note right here on my monitor because I rewatched the stream from last week and Andy Philpot donated at the very end of the stream and I did not give him a shout out. So Andy, I saw it. Thank you, dude. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Crypto Lola gifting another membership as we say that. Thank you so much. If you were gifted a membership today, the next time we do a member stream, which may be about three weeks from now or so, we do them about once a month or so, um, you will be able to come hang out for that, and it's a little bit more unscripted. So with that, enough of me with the preamble. Let's get into this, man. Let's talk about a modern paper money mania. But first, allow me to set the scene. I'm going to test the volume here, and I hope it sounds good. We're going to find out together. ATX feels like the past year has been hard. I find myself between the when everyone is bullish, be cautious, and the the trend is your friend. Let me know if you can hear what are your thoughts on this. Yeah, Oscar Santana, it has been difficult. Um, this is where this is where the the bifurcation between economics and financial markets really. Uh, comes into focus, right? Because we have very concerning data globally. Germany's economy looks like absolute fucking dog shit. And the Let me DAX, know if you can hear this. Their stock market is at all time highs. Look at the DAX. Ignore all my fucking spaghetti. Look at the DAX. This is an economy in a recession. Their manufacturing sector has like is going through severe convulsions. They've been outproduced on vehicles by China. They put all of their energy hopes in Russia, and then Russia invaded Ukraine. And they're if you look at their industrial sectors of their economy, they're month after month, they just look like ass. Like I shared one of them this morning. Uh here. German retail sales expected 0.4, actual negative 1.9. Like they're getting rinsed and their stock market looks like ours. Like what's going on over there? And it's doing the same thing here, right? Our manufacturing sector looks like dog shit. There are really concerning rates of growth in labor. But we printed so much money that it's still wreaking havoc in financial markets while Main Street does less and less well, right? It's harder and harder for them to keep up, even though they're getting high wage increases, even though net savings in American bank accounts, according to Bank of America, are higher than they were before the pandemic on average, they're less in percentage terms, than the change in prices over that time. So like people have more money, but things cost more and they're feeling it. 
but the market is going up. So everyone's looking around and going, are we crazy? No, it's that we printed 40% of all money that existed in an 18 month window after COVID and we rained it down. We didn't print it and then siphon it to the certain parts of the economy that need it on a on a metered basis. We literally printed it in a massive stack and pushed it out the window and everyone was standing down below to catch it. And then they just went and did whatever they wanted with it. We printed like nine trillion fucking dollars. We had a trillion dollars worth of PPP loans. Most of that was forgiven. The Fed found that most of that went into the pockets of business owners rather than to save jobs. I'll show you. Retrospective. I always remember some random word I used in a tweet, and that's how I look up my tweets. <laughs> a brutal retrospective of the PPP loan program by the St. Louis Fed found that nearly three quarters of all loans went directly to business owners and the top 20% of incomes, not to save jobs. Then they increased unemployment benefits to the point where people who made minimum wage made more money by being unemployed. Then we rained down three levels of stimmy checks upon people. Here, these three white lines. And then Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell decided to play liquidity games ever since the banking fears early last year. And now we have the wealthy, the top 1%, getting 5% cash deposit rates on their massive hordes of dollars. And so they're speculating. No one believes the Fed will actually do the needful. So they're speculating that the Fed put still exists. People of lower incomes are finding it harder to get ahead. So they are speculating because they feel fucking hopeless. So yeah, it's, it's hard, Oscar. It's hard. I, I relate with what you're saying. So that was me a few days ago, and I, I think it was better for me to show you that than to try to duplicate it because this is kind of a stream of consciousness. But I think it captures a lot of what we're seeing. And, and it, the, depending on who you ask, you will get a completely different story about what is going on right now. That is a bit atypical, right? For no one to be on the same page. And I, the bifurcation, as I mentioned in the monologue there, between financial markets and the real economy, it feels cavernous. Right. It, it feels like an ocean. Um, and I really do believe that it is symptoms of a money crisis, a budding monetary crisis that will potentially define this decade when we look back, you know, far in the future. And we're able to see this uh, from an unbiased lens. I think it sets up for that. And when you. When you think about it, it's it's really we have too much money chasing too few goods and the distribution of that money was uneven, as I talked about. Right. The PPP loan program. A lot of that went to scammers and to business owners. It didn't actually go to preserving jobs for the people it was meant to go to. A lot of business owners didn't even have employees, but because of the lax nature of the program, they were still able to file for benefits. And that just went straight into their pockets. Right. Uh, we had the Fed buying corporate debt. We had QE running at $120 billion a month for way too fucking long during zero interest rate policy. Uh, and that created a lot of excesses in the system. When you look at the share of checkable deposits and currency held by the top 1%, it took a massive leap during this period of time. If you look at the share of the same checkable deposits and currency, that is money in the bank held by the bottom 50%, the share of the national sum of that. The bottom 50% have fallen at the same time the top 1% have risen. Look, they're literally opposites of each other. And despite the fact that all of these people are getting 4%, you know, the average 
national worker is getting 4% wage increases. The cost of goods, of groceries, of living has exceeded that over that period of time. So while they're getting the highest wage increases they've gotten in their entire lives, they are falling further behind and they feel it. And then to make the gaslighting worse, political leaders constantly tell them how well the economy is doing. And so it's creating friction. And a, 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 a feeling, a sensation akin to gambling is seeping into the people, right? Sports gambling websites are exploding. Day trading has seen an incredible rise in the last few years, really kicked off in 2020. We have crypto meme coins doing thousand X's that are named Elizabeth Horan and Geo Bowden and shit like that. Jesus crust. And they're going, they're going to the moon. Like we have a literal meme named dog with hat. That's gone to $4 billion in like two months. It's already in like the top 30, I think. Uh, and it just feels like there is an increasing sense of desperation to make a return because there isn't the feeling that you can build for the future through the traditional rails, right? The pathways that our parents and grandparents had for establishing a wealth, you know, a future wealth for themselves, building a quality of life, those pathways are less clear now and they don't appear as available. And you can see some of these hints in the actual data of people today, right? Here's a survey from Experian. That's one of the major credit agencies. Many Gen Zers and millennials seeking financial independence. This is a weird title because it's not what the data shows. This is from June of last year, right? More than half of Gen Zers and millennials are still financially dependent on their parents. This is a survey. Gen Zers are 18 to 26. Millennials are my age. I'm somewhat or financially dependent on my parents. It's at least 50%. I prefer to spend money on life experiences like concerts and traveling rather than saving for retirement. It's 60%. 60 percent. Six keep sixty percent of people my fucking age, 40 years old, with families and children, are more interested in life experiences than retirement because they probably don't even think they're gonna get there. It's not just in the US, it's also happening in China. Young Chinese, Chinese youth unemployment is skyrocketing. And they are also seeing an increase in gambling behavior, right? We also see here in the U.S. a massive difference between the wealth generation of the, the wealth creation of the different generations. Millennials are in their prime years and are quickly becoming the most dominant U.S. household. But boomers still own half of nationwide net worth. Millennials now entering their 40s are only at 30% of the level of net wealth that boomers had when they entered the 40s in the early 1980s. So it, does anyone wonder why younger generations seem to have low morale about their ability to create prosperity for themselves using the same traditional rails? Is it any wonder why we have an increase in gambling? So let's take a moment here and let's let's. Let's walk back in time. <clears throat> There's a book I read called On Chinese Currency by William Vissering. It was written in 1877. And I bought this book because I just I like buying physical books. Um, but you can get a PDF online and I, I might include that in the uh, in the notes for this video. But what I want to get to is that when you read this book, one of the things that you come away with is this recognition that this book was written, you know, 200, 150 years ago, excuse me, and it's about a period of time that is a thousand years ago. Like we're talking about the Song Dynasty in China, which was uh, about a thousand, twelve hundred years ago, depending on uh, you know which which date period we're talking about. And even back then, they had the same kind of money crises, though the nature of them was different. They were dealing with coined money, and they had a lot more problems with actual counterfeiting and clipping of coined money, similar to the way that the ancient Romans dealt with. 
but this is on the opposite side of the world. So here is a quote. There was a period of time in the early Song Dynasty when people were allowed to coin their own money. And it was, an, it was kind of an experiment the government ran for a while. And during this period, they started having all kinds of problems, as you may anticipate. But this was, this was a long time ago, right? And, and society was still kind of learning these lessons. It may seem like we haven't learned them up to today, but back then it was even worse. They had even less information and even less history to go off of. Here is a quote from about a thousand years ago. This was a minister in the Sung Dynasty. He says, At present, husbandry, which is like farming and ranching, at present, husbandry runs the risk of decaying, and the number of people who seek to obtain copper daily increases. They leave their plowshares, they melt and cast and blow the charcoal. The bad coins are daily made in larger quantities, while the five species of grain are not made to increase. The virtuous are led astray, whereas the wicked are respected. The people are falling into a snare, and the number of executions will be enormous and without judicial inquiry. What expedient will put an end to such a desolate state in the empire? Now, I love reading these old language because I just like the way people talked back then. But let's pack that. Let's unpack this a little bit. Husbandry runs the risk of decaying. Farming and ranching runs the risk of decaying. The number of people who seek to obtain money daily increases. They leave their plowshares. They leave their jobs in order to create money for themselves. That bad money is increased daily in larger quantities, while no one works to increase the species of grain in the stores for the city. Virtuous are led astray, and the wicked are respected. On men are elevated. The people are falling into a snare. What expedient will put an end to this? I find that remarkable, because you know what I first thought of? Soul meme coins. Like right now, we have, I saw someone in CT about a week ago, and I, I wish I could find the tweet for you, uh, who said that um, there was like a thousand coins that were made on one day. Maybe it's more than that now, for all I know. But there were four digits worth of meme coins being created, and they're all pump and dumps, right? Very few of them actually go anywhere. The vast majority of them are literally creating money out of nothing, and then they just rug whoever gets in it. And it's pure gambling at the farthest edges of the risk curve of gambling, right? And it sounds a lot like this period of time in China a millennia ago when they were experimenting with allowing people to forge their own copper coins. But what they found were people were mixing them with base metals, right? That way that their their weight was the same, but their actual, you know, value was not. They eventually the coins would become clipped so that the unsuspecting wouldn't quite notice that that coin weighed a little bit less. And over time, as the money gets worse, it just exercises more and more degradation on the morale of the people using that money. And when I read through this book, there's so many of these quotes kind of like that, right? Where it talks about how inflation is just destroying people's trust in the money itself. <clears throat> and here's another one. To receive back only one piece of, of coin for the value of two pieces is more painful than being beaten with a whip and cudgel. This was someone in 140 B.C., talking about how the prices of things were changing so quickly that they would go in to exchange them expecting to get a certain value back and and nothing was could possibly be relied upon there was no stability in the market and so people eventually lost all confidence in their currency <clears throat> listen to this quote where is it is this it is this the one Sorry, I'm popping around a little bit. Oh, here we go. Let me, let me zoom out. When you go through these periods, what ends up happening a lot of the time is that real money, which for the longest time were gold and silver and to a certain degree copper, those things would end up being hoarded. It's Gresham's Law. The, when you have poor money in circulation, the better money ends up being hoarded and kept because people will spend the worst money that they can possibly spend in order to exchange for other goods. They will give you the shittiest dollar bill in their wallet if you will take it and they will keep the best 
most crisply printed dollar bills if they're able to. That's a simple example, but that's basically how Gresham's Law works. And throughout these stories, you hear a lot about periods where as the money got worse, the specie vanished. The specie meaning gold and silver coins, precious metals. The rich people of the present time have made it their business to hoard up the money in their depositories. After having exhausted the taxes, the government has put the money of the empire into the royal treasury, meaning the government's been now taking in all the gold. Not that different from Roosevelt in 1932 or whenever uh, that with um, the 1602 Act w- requiring all U.S. citizens to turn in their gold and no longer allowing you to buy gold. And once the government has put it in, it cannot be got out again. And then the paper money has been instituted and brought out to supersede the copper money. So the government would take in the real money and then they would give you paper substitutes. And they would say, this is what you have to use from now on. But that paper money is not so advantageous as the copper money to circulate through the empire. But now the paper money circulates and the quantity of real money is little, meaning there are no real coins anywhere. You can't exchange your worthless paper for anything of actual value. The result of this will be not only that no commodities are to be had or seen, but also that even no money will be had or seen anymore. Meaning that as the money got worse and worse, people hoarded gold, then they hoarded silver and copper, and then they began hoarding real goods grains and things like that, anything that they could exchange for value because the money itself was absolutely worthless. But since the corruption and listen to this, but since the corruption and misery of ancient and modern times have succeeded each other to this very day, it has always been seen that when matters had reached a climax, a change was nigh. And as once that change comes, a whole revolution is the result. If once that revolution has been brought about, it can't be changed again. When the paper money is now abolished, it may result in the reappearance of the stored up metallic money. So these people in ancient China, they went through these cycles again and again. You read about multiples of them through this book where the government would come in. It would say, hey, we're going to create our own money. We need to pay for a war. We need to pay for government spending, this, that, and the other thing. We need to create new government issues. We're going to do that. Please make sure that you circulate these notes at the value that we say they're at. And that starts for a period of time. But then through human greed and all of the different forces of the market, the money starts losing quality. And as that happens, the things of real value circulate less and less. And eventually the people lose so much confidence that there's there's a reset of some kind. There's either a revolution, they replace the government with someone who will actually do their bidding, or there's a market convulsion and an actual reset of the values of things themselves. Through some form or another, there is a change. And during those periods of time, the gold and silver and hoarded grain comes back out from all of those who had been hoarding it in their depositories. And for a period of time, what you'll find is that that circulates as money and no one will accept paper. I tried to find the quote in here somewhere and I couldn't find it, but there was a mention that During one of these collapses in the Sung Dynasty, the Sung Dynasty had two of them in particular, though there were other dynasties with similar problems. The Sung Dynasty, during one of those collapses, no merchants accepted paper money for a couple of centuries afterwards. So like these can have long stretching consequences. And granted, this is a long time ago. Right. We were in a different era now. So you like again, you can't draw perfect parallels. But I just find it fascinating that The human behavior in the market doesn't change much. What changes are the contemporary themes and the technology that we're discussing, right? The technology we use to facilitate the market itself, the tech we use in our economy, the kinds of things that people prioritize in their daily lives, but the behavior of humans, their greed, their fear, the way that they hoard good money and try to get rid of bad money. And the way that the government is always trying to compel people, to, the people to circulate poor money at par, those patterns repeat over and over and over again. We learn how one issue of money succeeded the other, 
how every time new names were invented to delude the people. Solemn promises were made that henceforth the government should fulfill what it had charged itself with, and the result was that again and again old debts were paid by incurring new debts in order to defer the impending bankruptcy of the state. So over and over again, the government would realize confidence was being lost in the money. They would come up with some new scheme in order to convince people that this new version of the money is going to be better than that one we just ruined. Trust us. And all that ends up happening is that they repeat the same cycles again and again. This pattern will come back up here in a minute in something we'll talk about with Austria, about how new issues are are presented to the people as a solution. But as confidence is lost, the effect of those becomes less and less. <clears throat> and here's a last one from ancient China before we move on to more contemporary history. After trying for years and months to support and maintain these notes, meaning the government tried for a really long time to continually circulate the most recent money that they had created and ensure that the market accepted them. After trying for years and months to support and maintain these notes, the people had no longer any confidence in them, but they were, a pos they were positively afraid of them. The payment for government purchases was made in paper. The fund of the salt manufacturers consisted of paper. The salaries of all of the officials were paid in paper. The salaries received, the, or sorry, the soldiers received their pay in paper. Of the provinces and districts, there was not one that, dis not, that did not discharge its debts in paper. Copper was seldom seen, and it was considered a treasure. So it was natural that the prices of commodities rose while the value of the paper money fell more and more. Among the people, this caused them, already disheartened, to lose all energy. The soldiers were continually anxious that they should not get enough to eat, and the inferior officials in all parts of the empire raised complaints that they didn't have enough to procure common necessities. All of this was a result of the depreciation of the paper money. When in ancient days the money had its full value and paper money was issued, the effect was convenience and profit. But today, when there is a total demand for metallic money, but they are instead given paper, the effect is corruption and disease and increased forgery. I, I love reading about this stuff. I find this absolutely fascinating. Let's move on to something a little more modern, right? Let's move on to another book called A History of American Currency. I have quoted this more than I have quoted anything else on my timeline ever on Twitter since I've been on there. This is a book. You can get a copy of this. Let me find it for you. A History of American Currency Mises. If you go to the Mises website, if you search literally what I just typed in, they have a copy of this book, a free PDF copy, and that's the one that we'll use today. I'll put it in the chat. This isn't depressing, Ursic. This is history. We go through these cycles, right? But think about this. Think about this if you think that this is, an, is, this is all negative. We're reading these stories, yet here we stand today. China still exists. They're the second largest economy in the world. The United States still stands, but we are about to read about multiple crises. These things are not the end of civilization. They are periods of excess. They demonstrate that humans do not learn lessons very well, that we're not very good at remembering history, and that human nature changes very little across millennia. Those are the things I take away from it, things that I think are fascinating. And if you're going to be in the markets, reading about these things, in my view, can help round out your perspective and your detection of the kind of market that you are in. And we're reading about a government printing money to no end to pay for whatever the fuck they want to pay for. And the people continually losing confidence because the economy is getting away from them. Their ability to create wealth is getting away from them. They start pulling away from the traditional methods of building wealth, which is actually working on productive enterprises. Instead, they want to focus on gambling and playing in the markets, the over-financialization of everything. I think those are very timely lessons that we can take away. So let's start out first. <clears throat> One of the first lessons in this book 
is about what happened in Austria right at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. The book is called A History of American Currency, but these this happened around the same time as a panic that happened in the U.S. After the end of the Napoleonic Wars, there was a lot of turmoil in Europe, and those things had an effect on what was going on in the U.S. at that time. Even though it was 150 years ago, 200 years ago, sorry, the Napoleonic Wars were over 200 years ago, um, even though it was that long ago, we still had a global economy. We still had trade partners. There were still effects that rippled across borders. <clears throat> I'm not going to read this entire uh, chapter here, but there is a chap. Th this entire chapter is on the Mises website along with the PDF. And what it talks about is the creation of the first bank in Austria. And initially, the bank was issuing notes which had the full backing of the specie in their depositories. It was not fractional reserve. And then what's interesting, it says in 1762, about 62 years after the foundation of the Austrian bank, this apparently rich source of wealth was seized upon as a resource for the distress of the government. And from that time to today, meaning 1870s when this was written, Austria has been under the dominion of paper. And from that point on, for more than a century, every year has seen a deficit in the Austrian finances. This goes through the story about how the Napoleonic Wars are very stressful in their economy, and in order to pay for these things and many other things, the government started issuing its own money. <clears throat> And the money, the issuing of that money, just became, it grew out of control. And it says here in 1810, the next stage that was reached is a stage which the student of paper money meets so regularly in its history that he anticipates it sooner or later in one form or another. So we're about to find out the same things happen over and over again. So as the as the current issue of Austrian money was losing confidence, they came up with something new. The uh, I believe it was the Habsburg monarchy at the time. They came up with a new class of notes called redemption notes to represent coin and to exchange for paper at the rate of one to three. This plan and others intended to support it failed to attract even the popular attention. All confidence in the promises of the government was lost. What would we just say? We learn how one issue succeeded the other, how every time new names were invented to delude the people. Solemn promises were made that the government would fulfill what it had promised, and the result was that again and again, old debts were paid by incurring new in order to defer the impending bankruptcy of the state. This was a thousand years ago in China. This was 200 years ago in Austria. A new class of notes was created, but this plan failed because all confidence in the promises of the government were lost. The misery was wide and deep, reaching even the well-to-do classes. Persons on salaries found themselves in the position of day laborers. The peasants and country people had, had their products for food, but trade was brought to a standstill. So we keep going forward here, and it starts talking about the anticipation notes. At first, 45 million notes were issued, but the issues were secretly increased to 426 million, meaning they literally 10 times the money supply. In 1816, the amount of paper money was over 638 million. A historian at the time said this. I find this, ch this paragraph right here to be really fascinating. Hold on. Austria, in this period here uh, in the 1810s, offered the strange spectacle of a state buried in the stillness of death, a grotesque conglomerate of states of different sizes, some of which did not dare, others which did not know how to breathe independently and freely. Undeniably, the paper money exercised the worst influence on the morale of the people. Frugality and diligence were lost virtues. Vulgar pleasure-seeking and wild extravagance became habitual even in the lowest classes. And what use to care for the future? Why not enjoy today all the pleasures of the senses? How could anyone hesitate to pay 200 golden for admission to a ball? In fact, the money had no value, and if you stood reflecting, you might lose ball and money both. The very fact of speaking continually of large sums, which in truth amounted to very small value, just stimulated more frivolity and folly. 
as the money got worse, people took things less and less seriously. They just stopped giving a fuck, right? They started gambling and it just promoted worse and worse behavior. And it put it put Austria into an actual crisis. And they spent about five years dealing with a massive sovereign default. And it wasn't until they built the Austrian National Bank in 1816 that they kind of started to dig their way out of those things. But let me fast forward. There was was that that was was that all about the Austrian? I want to make sure I covered all that. But yeah, I I just really liked this part here because it says vulgar pleasure seeking and wild extravagance became habitual of what used to care for the future. Why not enjoy today all the pleasures of the senses, right? I prefer to spend money on life experiences like traveling and concerts rather than saving for retirement. 60% of people from ages 18 to 40 fucking two feel that way today. More than half of people have a hard time denying themselves making impulse purchases for something they don't need. And, and it's it's a lack of perspective about the future and a lack of feeling like your prospects are are uh, attainable. Those things. When you compound those over time, they lead to unrest, right? Is it a wonder why we're seeing a rise of populism? I'm speaking about the U.S. We're talking about what happened in Austria a couple hundred years ago. These are people in the U.S. We also see rising youth unemployment in China and an increasing amount of people playing the lottery over there because they're literally in the great financial crisis. And you can find other stories like this kind of around the world. And it's because in a large portion, people feel left behind, right? Millennials are entering their 40s and they don't have as much wealth as the boomers had. But there's more money circulating now today than ever before. Those things don't add up in people's minds. And it's hard for them to get their head around how they're supposed to build something for themselves unless they just fucking gamble like everybody else is doing. Fast forward just a couple more years. We're back in the U.S. This is in Pennsylvania. This particular blurb is in Pennsylvania. But what ended up happening, there were the Napoleonic Wars that went to about 1815. And during that period of time, the U.S. declared war on Great Britain, and we had the War of 1812, which took until about 1814 or 15 for us to resolve. During that same period of time, we had a lot of land speculation that was driving up the values of land, and it was creating a lot of imbalances in the market. And after the Napoleonic Wars ended, that too added to some of the economic disruption. We had prices jumping all over the place because there were a lot of British goods that got dumped on the U.S. market, and it created a lot of unemployment. There were bankruptcies, dissolution of businesses. It was just a big fucking mess. And if you want to read about it, you can go look at Wikipedia and look at the Panic of 1819. It's not the best Wikipedia article. Article. It's kind of short, but it'll give you a primer on what happened there. Maybe the first two, three sections are what you should really focus on. But during this period, here we go. In August 1819, 20,000 people were seeking employment in Philadelphia, and there was a similar state of things in New York and Baltimore. 30 different jobs, which employed about 9,600 people, employed only 2,100 just three years later. So that's, gosh, what is that? 96,72 minus 2,137 divided by 96. Wow, 77% of people in these trades, in this particular, whatever industries it's talking about here, lost their jobs. That's insane, 77% unemployment in some of these trades. Trades which only trades which employed 1,900 people in Pittsburgh in 1815 employed only 672 four years later. That's another contraction of about 66%. The papers were filled with advertisements. All this was used as an argument why we needed to protect American industry. Populism became more popular at that period of time, right? We had more unemployment as a result of a bunch of uh, excess speculation. We had banks running wild. They created far too many loans. And there were insolvencies running rampant around the nation. There were a bunch of state banks that went under. Uh, This was a period of time called wildcat banking, when 
um, the original colonies the they first started out with banking the like near eastern states and it started spreading westward and it was a literal wild west expansion of banking there's a lot of mess a lot of people made money a lot of fortunes were destroyed and we had multiple crises and panics throughout the middle 1800s as we developed the railroads as as you know American pilgrim or a colonialism or not colonialism as American expansion moved westward. Right. We started to fill in those states. The committee of the Senate of Pennsylvania described ascribed the distress to abuses of banking. There were a lot of reasons why there were problems in the 1800s and why we had the panic in 1819. But they believed at the time it was mostly because of banking. In consequence of this most destructive measure, measure, the inclination of a large part of the people created by past prosperity to live by speculation and not by labor was greatly increased. Oh, why is it? Why is it fucking up? Don't fuck up here. Don't fuck up. A spirit in all respects akin to gambling prevailed. A fictitious value was given to all kinds of property. Specie, again, precious metals, was driven from circulation as if by common consent, and all efforts to restore society to its natural condition were treated with undisguised contempt. The inclination of people, because of their past prosperity, to live by speculation and not by labor was increased. A spirit in all respects akin to gambling prevailed. What does that sound like? That sounds like at present, husbandry runs the risk of decaying in the number of people who seek to obtain copper daily increases. They leave their plowshares to melt and cast and blow the charcoal. The virtuous are led astray. So it was in all the great cities that vendors of tape and bobbins were transformed into persons of high blood, and the sons of respectable citizens were converted into knaves of rank through speculation and the facilities of the abominable paper money system. Now, those are some big words, but essentially there was a lot of wealth turning hands, right? Fortunes were destroyed. People of low rank were suddenly elevated all because the money was absolutely fucking broken and everyone was gambling. The newspapers of 1819 contain numerous accounts of riots, incendiary fires, frauds and robberies. The House Committee spoke of the change of the moral character of many of our citizens by the presence of distress. You've got to be thinking to yourself, this, this sounds so similar. What we're reading about in China a thousand years ago sounds like what was happening in Pennsylvania in 1819. And it sounds a lot like what's going on today. People are losing hope in the future. They're, they're focusing on gambling. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we have created excess claims on capital, right? We have too much money printing. And that distribution is not happening equally. And as a result of the imbalances it is creating, because... As I mentioned in the opening monologue, when we watched the clip from my stream the other day, we, we printed all of this money in response to COVID. We did not distribute it in any kind of a fair or equitable way. We didn't put it in industries that needed it more than others or do anything strategic. We literally printed it in a massive pallet and we just shoved it out the window of the treasury and dumped it on America. And we just said, go, go have fun. Please don't send us into a depression. And so what ended up happening was, as we looked at with the checkable deposits in currency, which I closed that chart, the 1% gained a huge market share. They're sitting on hordes of cash because they have a lower marginal propensity to consume. They are less likely to spend dollars they are given because they don't fucking need them. And so all they're doing is now sitting on hordes of cash that because we have raised interest rates is just giving them a 5% cash rate. So now their massive hordes of savings that they were just rained down on from the government are getting 5% deposit rates for a bunch of people who do not need the money. And so they are pumping up financial markets and they're driving things even higher and putting even more pressure on the people that feel that they must find a way to keep up. This is a section from the book I want to spend a minute on. Because I think it describes, I, I, I recognize that not everyone is on the same 
uh, level of their economic understanding and study as as everybody else. Some of uh, some people are f- much further ahead than I am. Some people are much further behind where I'm at in their learning and their kind of understanding of terms and topics and things like that. And so th- there's a section of this book here where it talks about the difference between capital and currency, right? The difference between capital and money and how when we create excess claims, we're not actually becoming any richer. And I find that this section of the book is really, it's, it's articulated extremely well. And I think it makes this point uh, in a way better than I could. <clears throat> and it talk it says, uh, the, it, it talks about um, a few things before this. I'm, I guess we don't have to get into that. <clears throat> Our other resource when straightened for capital, the thing which we had betaken ourselves before was employed. What it's saying is what we started doing was a multiplication of paper representatives of capital, meaning we started printing a lot of paper money. Capital is the portion of all of the previous product of a nation, which at any given time is available for new production. Capital is the productive output of a society. It is all of their money and goods and knowledge and tools that can be deployed for the creation of more capital, of more productive goods. Capital will be a certain amount of tilled land, Houses, buildings, stock, tools, food, clothing, roads, bridges, etc., which have been made and are ready for use in producing, transporting, and exchanging new products. That's what capital is. When you go in the old days, when we, before we had fractional reserve banking and, and people who could see, seemingly get loans for nothing, you had to present capital as collateral to get a loan, right? And you wouldn't get a loan unless you had good capital to put on loan, to put on lend. Uh, But as 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 we get deeper into credit cycles, those standards tend to deteriorate. These things, capital, are all of the products of labor and they require time for their production. Nothing but labor spent upon them can produce others and time is required for this labor to issue new and increased possessions. This is also an analogy for proof of work in Bitcoin. Nothing can release new Bitcoin but the exercising of labor and time upon the breaking of the algorithm, the solving of the new block, right? That is the only thing that can do it. There is no ability by you already having some existing Bitcoin for you to influence the release of new Bitcoin, which is what happens in proof of stake, which is what happens in other currencies like fiat and things where those who have the most exercise the largest influence over the ability to create more, right? People who are close to the money printer, the Cantillon effect. These things of capital are all the product of labor and they require time to be produced. Nothing but labor spent on them can produce more. Currency, money, only serves to distribute capital into the proper hands so that it can be efficiently applied into new production. That's all that money does. It lets us distribute our goods and services to one another. Banks only facilitate the transfer of this capital from hands where it is idle, from places where it's not being used, or distributed into small quantities, and then moving it into hands which it will be usefully employed. Currency, therefore, isn't capital any more than ships are freight. It's just a labor-saving machine for making easy transfers. Banks do not create wealth. They only facilitate its creation by distributing capital in the most advantageous manner. If, therefore, currency is multiplied, it is a delusion to suppose that capital is also multiplied. So if we artificially increase the representations of money. It's only like increasing the number of tickets that have a claim on a stock of goods. The ticket holders would be deceived, and in the end, they could only get a proportional dividend of the original stock. If banks not only lend capital, but then they lend coined credit, they literally just make up paper money out of nowhere. They just lend out of nowhere. Sometime or another, a liquidation must come. This is speaking about fractional reserve banking here to a degree, right? Banks lending far in excess of the actual capital they have on possession. 
If banks not only lend against their capital, but they also lend coined credit, sometime or another a liquidation must come. There must be an effort to touch the capital that the notes pretend to convey. I love that. I love those words right there. There must be an effort to touch the capital that the notes pretend to convey. Then it is found that they represent nothing. Credit breaks down, and there must be a settlement, a liquidation, a dividend, and a new start. We divide up the capital we have and find out that we only possess 50 or 75% of what we thought. We then put smaller figures on everything, write everything down, reconcile ourselves to smaller hopes. But soon enough, the experience is forgotten, and the old process of inflation and delusion begins again. This was written 150 years ago. Guys, nothing changes. This time isn't different, right? They're always the same. I'm pulling from all different periods of history, and we're reading the same kind of messaging over and over again. Just to kind of cap off this, this study of the history of American currency, and then we'll move on from this. There's another quote in here. Uh, by, I have, there are quotes all over this book, this fantastic book. But what I found interesting was during the 1860s, which is a bit ahead of this period there, during the middle of the Civil War, we had the greenback crisis, right? The government was trying to fund its war efforts. And they were also having debates about legal tender laws and about the, the ability or the right of a government to issue a legal tender note and whether that was even the right thing to do, whether government should even be involved in the issuing of money. These were debates we were having in the 1860s. But the interesting thing about it is that when people pushed back against the idea of the government printing money to pay for its expenses, the people who pushed back used the same kind of political rhetoric that people today use when you say that the U.S. government is on an unsustainable path. Listen to this. The spirit of the debate was that of panic. The finances had been allowed to drift into a serious condition, and then, instead of applying cool and calm reason to find out and correct mistakes, recourse was taken to the last and most desperate resources. The financial interests of a great nation for an indefinite future were staked upon a desperate resource to tide over a temporary exigency, a temporary spending. When the le Here we go. When the lessons of history were quoted, meaning when people said, look, every time there has been an irredeemable paper currency, it has brought problems. When the lessons of history were quoted, they were answered by the flag and the eagle. Listen to that. When the lessons of history were quoted, they were answered by the flag and the eagle. That kind of reminds me of Ron Paul complaining about the deficit and people thinking that he thought that the government couldn't make good on its on its on its uh, on its credit. Right. The full faith and credit of the United States was being uh, disrespected by Ron Paul. When the lessons were quoted, they were answered by the flag and the eagle. When caution was urged in view of possible future spending, that's what exigencies are, when caution was urged in view of possible future spending, it was answered by prophecies of military success and the denunciation of rebels. Oh, you think that this spending isn't going to do anything? We're just going to go in there and crush them. All right? That's, that's exactly the kind of thing we would have said today. When the need of deliberation was urged, it was answered by clamor in regard to the necessities of government. When someone said, hey, slow down. We need to talk about this. They were saying, no, we need to do this now. This is immediate. This is important. The government will never default. We're the United fucking States. When it was prophesied that the paper would depreciate and that we should not be able... Let me take this highlight off. I can't even see. It's... it's, it's uh, My underline is, is messing me up. Here we go. When it was said that irredeemable paper had always wrought ruin, it was answered that our resources are unlimited and these precedents do not make a rule for us. When it was prophesied that the paper would depreciate, that we should not be able to retrace our steps, the prophets of evil were indignantly pointed to the pledged faith of the United States and asked if they thought that that would be violated. 
The inference that the notes must be made legal tender because the government needed money was never analyzed and its fallacy never shown. The proposition involves an absurdity. Whatever strength a nation has is weakened by issuing legal tender notes. That's the opinion of this author. I just find that fascinating there. When the lessons of history were quoted, they were answered by the flag and the eagle. When caution was urged so that we don't continually spend more and more, it was answered by prophecies of military success and the denunciation of rebels. When people said, whoa, 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 we need to deliberate this a little bit more, we need to slow down, it was answered by clamor and the necessities of the government. When someone said, hey, if we have an irredeemable paper currency and people can't even turn it in for gold, it was answered, hey, our resources are unlimited and this doesn't make a rule for us. When it said, hey, the paper is going to depreciate and we're not going to be able to go back to the way it was before. They were considered prophets of evil and they were pointed to the pledged faith of the United States. Did they think that was going to be violated? Sounds a lot like the political rhetoric that we have today when it comes to the deficit. And there are signs, there are signs that we are in a form of a credit mania, right? We looked at this survey of millennials and Gen Zers who the vast majority of them would rather pay for experiences. There's all kinds of stories. This is from 2022. Millennials don't see the point of planning for retirement. Back in 2022, 45% of millennials didn't think it was time to save for the future. And this is in 2023, and 63% of millennials felt that way. That's a huge jump. Granted, it's two different surveys, but that's a big difference. That's a 20% jump. Young people in China playing the lottery. The sales price of houses outpacing the median income by like five times since I was born. I was born in this area here. Look at that. Households are more indebted. Home prices have outpaced median income by three or four times. And the millennials are only at a third of the wealth generation that their parents were at. The interest rate on credit cards is at all-time highs. Home ownership affordability is at all-time lows. But we still see a mania in credit, right? We've talked about here in previous streams about the excess of lending going on in the shadow lending markets outside of the commercial banks, outside of the purview of the Fed, and how those places are showing the kinds of signs that are present in a mania. Here's one of the last things I'll touch on. Here's a book called Manias, Panics, and Crashes by Charles Kindleberger. This is the fifth edition. There's been a bunch of editions of it. Uh, this is recommended reading if you're a financial historian, this book right here. And it talks about the real estate boom in Japan in the 1980s. Here's some more parallels, guys. During the 1980s, real estate prices in Japan increased by a factor of 10 and stock prices by a factor of 6 or 7. In the second half of the decade, Japan experienced an economic boom. The rates of return earned by real estate investors appeared to be about 30% a year. Business firms recognized that the profit rate on real estate investment was substantially higher than the profit rate from continuing to make steel or automobiles or TV sets, so they became large investors in real estate using money borrowed from the banks. Husbandry runs the risk of decaying, and the number of people who seek to obtain money daily increases. They leave their plowshares, they melt and cast and blow the charcoal. Bad coins are made in larger quantities, while the five species of grain are not made to increase. Businesses recognized that the profit rate on real estate investing was much higher than building productive goods like steel, cars, and TVs, so they became large investors. Thousand years apart. Real estate prices were increasing many times more rapidly than rent. At some stage, the net rental income declined below the interest payments on the funds borrowed to buy the real estate, so the borrowers had a negative carry. They were having to pay more than they were making on the property. The borrowers might obtain the funds by increasing their loans against something they already owned, but then at the beginning of 1990, the new governor of the Bank of Japan told the banks to limit the growth of real estate loans. Once those bank loans begin to increase at only 5 or 6% a year, rather than 30% a year, 
Some of those firms and investors that needed cash to pay interest were no longer able to obtain new loans. They sold real estate, and the bubble began to implode. The parallels here are remarkable. And then you think, okay, what did they do here? Well, loans started declining, right? Then the values of the buildings started to fall. People became upside down. They had negative carries on their real estate loans. And then they had to start selling other assets in order to pay the ones that they felt were the most redeemable. They sold real estate and the bubble began to implode. The brutal reality, let's fast forward to today. The brutal reality of plunging office values is here. Commercial property deals in the U.S. are are starting to pick up at deep discounts that are forcing lenders around the world to brace for souring loans. China's property crisis is starting to ripple across the world. Discount prices could force a reassessment of industry losses. A $560 billion property warning hits banks from New York to Tokyo. Lenders face debt maturities, lower values after a thaw in deal-making. Euphoria on Fed pivot prospects ignores the lagging hangover. The impact of past rate hikes are still feeding through to the real economy, but debt costs and lower credit availability will weigh on demand. In real estate, we're already starting to see the cracks, right? We pushed valuations sky high, everyone participated, and then we had a rapid change to society. We had a pandemic that accelerated trends that had already begun, At the same time that we then encouraged a lot of early retirements because of the pandemic and because of all the stimulus. And so now we have a remote work revolution. And there is no way on planet Earth to know the Fed could cut rates to zero and it will not put bodies back in office buildings. But that market is not yet repriced. It's just kind of hanging in midair as everyone waits for the Fed pivot, but they are ignoring the hangover. And so you're starting to see more of these kinds of stories. I've tweeted about haircuts on real estate values. Let me pull that up. Uh, Haircuts. Haircut. Where is it? Look at some of these recent haircuts on office properties. The appraiser on a Fifth Avenue in Manhattan was 53% below the value in 2014. Something else in Manhattan was down a third from its value in 2017. So like were these you're starting to see these stories come out. And that's just in the real estate sector, right? That's specifically commercial real estate, so you know, office buildings, multifamily residential, things like that. And and it's not all encompassing. There are certain sectors that are in better shape than others, but largely office buildings and multifamily have not been repriced with current interest rates. They're still at valuations on people's books that they were at a few years ago. And then when you look at what is happening with businesses, right, who are trying to avoid paying current interest rates, they're going to private markets and they're taking out new debts in order to pay old debts so they can keep the plates spinning. What did we just read about a little while ago? We learn how one issue succeeded the other. New names were invented, solemn promises were made, the government would fulfill itself. But the result is, again and again, old debts are paid by incurring new debts. Now, this is talking about a government, but large entities in the market do the same thing. They say, we're going to run a better business, but then when push comes to shove, they just issue more debt, and then they find more and more creative ways to keep themselves alive, whatever the fuck it takes. So let's look at some of those stories. Private equity investors face expensive choice, 10% loans to get cash. Struggling borrowers turn to private credit to defer interest. Wall Street wants to let junk firms pay interest with more debt. Private equity makes loan payments with more debt to keep cash. Private equity funds are borrowing against themselves with the help of insurers. Flawed valuations threaten a $1.7 trillion private credit boom. Private credit is currently keeping a lot of businesses afloat. 
by offering exotic loans with very interesting terms that they can't get at a commercial bank, like allowing them to take out debt to pay other debt. And so as we look into 2024 and 25, JP Morgan strategist sees a big credit reckoning this year. Private credit data black hole because it's shadow banking because we cannot see what's going on in there. Spooks European bank watchdogs. And when you think about all that, it really it's that it's that chart that I showed that I've shown you guys a thousand times about the disparity between where rates were before and where they are today. And I know I feel it might seem like I'm bouncing around a bit, but all of this ties together. All of this ties together. We just came out of a period of record all-time easy policy, particularly this period right here from COVID until 2022, where we had zero interest rates. We had the biggest QE we've ever run on an ongoing basis at $120 billion a month. And we had people across the spectrum taking out as much debt as humanly possible, terming it out into the future as much as possible. Printing money, raining it down on everyone, creating all of these imbalances in the market, and then we suddenly change policy. But we haven't actually transitioned into that new world. Everyone is still kind of holding on to the old world. And that we're standing on that ledge while the real economy, what we've spent the first 90% of this stream talking about, the real economy is showing signs of stress from excess money printing, excess financial imbalances, from inflation itself, not just inflation of prices, but inflation of the money. And we're seeing people, societal decay is rising. Malaise is rising. People don't trust in institutions. They don't believe they have anywhere to go. And I, I think we, we see these cycles over and over again. And as I mentioned to someone in the chat a little while ago, f sorry, I'm, your name escaped me just now. These things can seem overwhelming, like we're, we, I just read a bunch of negative stuff, but it's history. And this stuff, these, these are things separated by centuries from each other, right, on different parts of the world. But we go through these cycles again and again, and we always think that this time is different. Um, but the markers are all there of a mania driven by excess claims on capital, right, by too much money chasing too few goods. Major productive economies like Germany's manufacturing sector look like total dog shit, but their stock market is at all-time highs. The U.S. manufacturing sector also kind of looks like this. GDP in the U.K. has been has not grown since Q1 of last year. It was flat in Q2, and it has contracted in the last two quarters. They're literally in a recession, but the FTSE is at all-time highs. Massive divergence between the financial markets and the health of the real economy, which is currently propped up by, for now, relatively full employment. But I, I think, I think when you look out across this this kind of landscape we sit in here, um, where we clearly have uh, strong markets and. Growth, as we try to, as we like to measure it, is still positive. There are a lot of signs that the the screws are coming loose, the rivets are starting to come loose right on the ship, and things are starting to get a little rickety. And when you read these stories in the past, like what we've just gone through today from ancient China, reading about the American colonies, there's many of other things I could have pulled from. These are just the ones that first came to mind. Um, these periods usually involve rising populism. Right, rising kind of social unrest and unhappiness with the status quo, and it's a real fourth turning vibe. I, I keep coming back to this fourth turning vibes kind of thing, where we've we've gone through a period of of prosperity for the for lack of a better word, until about you know ten or fifteen years ago we had a major financial crisis and we kind of papered over some of that stuff and and put lipstick on the pig and it's been another 15 years and real cracks are starting to show and the pandemic just made it worse uh, and I, I I'm led to the belief that sometime in, you know in the next five to ten years uh, we probably experience a, a sovereign currency crisis something bigger than we've experienced in our lifetime so far that 
forces a, a retooling of the global economic system. Right? We're already starting to see a little bit of that change with what's going on in China. Things that had been driving growth for the last two decades are necessarily having to change a bit because China is not in a position to play the exact same role doing the same things as they were before, and investors haven't quite caught on yet. And I think that recognition, much in the same way that it changed the world dramatically in the late 90s and early 2000s, I think it could change the world again if they have to start, if they have to find a new way to channel growth. And they're the second largest economy in the world. They're literally in the great financial crisis. And right now, the U.S. is the best looking one of the bunch. And we've got real problems. We've got real decay in people's trust in institutions and their desire to save for the future and their belief that they have a path through all this muck. And they're just gambling their hearts out, right? They're creating money out of nowhere. They are. They are melting and casting and blowing the charcoal they are leaving their plowshares we haven't seen unemployment rising but we do see a lot of gig workers right a lot of part-time employed we see a decline in full-time workers i just um that's kind of where I, my mind goes with all this let me take a sip of my water here let me catch up on the chat because i just talked for a good hour Took me a while to get through all that stuff, and I appreciate you guys being patient with me. Uh, I spent a long time getting this stuff together and kind of getting my thoughts because it's a big topic to try to talk about in one stream. Andy Philpot gifted another five memberships. Thank you, bro. A bunch of you guys have memberships thanks to Andy. Chris also gifting a membership. Appreciate it, man. Wow, Andy gifted another five. What a boss, dude. Just raining them down. Nipsey, have you talked about how BRICS nations are possibly joining in order to wipe out their own dollar-denominated debt? Well, the thing is, Nipsey, the BRICS nations have a lot of dollar-denominated debt, but nations owe that debt to each other. Like, nations write debts to each other in dollars when neither one of them is the U.S. So if nations are going to decide to default on their dollar-denominated debt— they will be defaulting on one another. They are not simply defaulting on the U.S. and telling the U.S. to go fuck itself. They're defaulting on whoever gave them that loan. Whoever is buying their dollar-denominated debt. It could be anyone. It could be a pension fund in Singapore. So they have to be really careful about whether or not they actually want to do that. And it... You didn't say this, but I find on Twitter that a lot of the discussion around what the BRICS will do and this topic of whether or not they'll pay their dollar debts or try to get out of the dollar system kind of gloss over what I just said, which is that dollar denominated debt is not all U.S. owned debt. They, in large part, own it to each other. Macro Anarchy said, this is so similar. It's scary. Nothing new under the sun. Exactly. And that's why, you know, as we've been going higher, I've spent a lot of time talking. I've been tweeting quotes from books. I've been talking about manias and I've been talking about sentiment. Now you guys can see some of the parallels I see. And this isn't even all of them. These Again, these were just the ones we touched on today. There are other examples from the books I mentioned and from many other sources and it's the same human behavior that we see each time. And uh, those things are now coming to the surface. We're printing money out the fucking ass. Our deficits are skyrocketing. And people are re people see that. They're looking forward and they're thinking, oh my God, those are the deficits I'm going to have to deal with when I get older. You know, it. it's a real mess. It's a real mess. Dennis says, is it from the book, The Price of Time? No, today, the books we read from, I'll show you their covers. Where is the cover? On Chinese Currency, Coin and Paper Money. By, here it is. This one of the books. Let me, let me get them out. Let me get the titles of them. History of American Currency by William Graham Sumner. This is the one that I put in the chat earlier. I'll put it there one more time. 
uh, that is a free PDF copy on the Mises website. Uh, it was written in 1874 by William Graham Sumner, who was a sociologist. So when you read his book, it's a little dry. There are sections where he's literally describing what the paper looked like, or he's giving you a dollar for dollar accounting of what the banks were holding at a point in time. And, you know, you can read that part if you want to read that part. But the 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 topics about what the people went through, the discussions around what the money should look like and the roles that it should play, that stuff is amazing because it's it's through the lens of a sociologist. Then this this book on Chinese currency by William Vissering, which was written in 1877. There is a free PDF version of this on archive.org. Let me see. On Chinese currency Vissering PDF. Yes. There might be a better one somewhere. Uh, but this is it here. I'll put this in the chat. Here's on Chinese currency. And then the third book that I only read the quote about Japan is Manias, Panics, and Crashes by Charles Kindleberger. Steve gifted five memberships. What a boss. Happy Easter, everyone. Thank you so much. I see participation trophy wife in there. What up, girl? Oh, it looks like maybe she had to dip out. Sorry, when I get in my mode, I miss the chat for like, you know, 10, 15, 30 minutes at a time. Crypto Lolic says, dude, you could make an audio stream reading this book. <laughs> well, I thought about that, but I don't know how many people actually want to just listen to me literally read the book page to page by page by page. That's what I wanted to talk about today. No charts. I want to talk about the money. I want to talk about out of control credit creation. I wanted to talk about the parallels in history from ancient China to the post revolutionary states in the U S what I might touch on in a future stream, probably a Sunday type of stream. There are a couple of other stories that relate to, I just found them interesting because there is one from the book from China. There is one from this book of a history of American currency. And then there is a third quote from a man named Edmund Burke. And he went to the pre-revolutionary colonies and he took a bunch of notes and he wrote about how society was forming in these colonies in the middle 1700s. And he talks about their challenges with quality, with getting access to good money and how there were more cries for more money and how the government would try to compel the circulation of the notes. And what I found is that in each of these instances of history, you can find very similar language. And one of those common denominators is the word compel compel the people to circulate the notes, the government having to force people to accept the tender notes because they didn't have confidence in them and trying to figure out ways to do that. So we may touch on that in a future stream and I'll, I'll leave it out of this one because we've already covered so much. So with all of that, I would appreciate your feedback on this stream today. This is a little different than what we usually do. Uh, I don't know how jumbled it was. I don't know how easy it was for you to follow because I have all this knowledge already. So let me know if there were, um, you know, awkward parts or if maybe it was hard to keep track. If I didn't explain something in particular very well, let me know in the comments and uh, we'll keep it rolling. I will be out of town Tuesday through Friday. So my next stream will need to be at the end of next week. I don't know if it'll be Friday or Saturday or I don't, I don't know exactly when, but I will try to book it as soon as I can. Um, and that's all I have to say about today. I'm, I hope that you guys learned a few things, not if not from me, but from history, right? From the things we read together. That they gave you a perspective maybe that you didn't have. Maybe they rounded out a perception you have about today's markets 
and you can see that there is nothing new under the sun, that the common denominator in every period of history is human behavior. Human nature does not change. We are driven by fear and greed and base emotions. We are imperfect creatures. And markets are merely a representation of many, many people expressing themselves. So they are an, it is an ever-present truism that human nature is the market. And you can just find these amazing parallels in history. And I think that we're at one of those turning points today where we see those excesses playing out to their ultimate conclusion. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here on a Sunday, a Easter Sunday. I hope you go spend some more time with your families. That's what I'm going to do. Smash that like button if you haven't. Share this with your friends and family. And we will talk to each other in just a few days. So until then, take care, friends. Take care of each other. I look forward to meeting with you again. Cheers, everyone.